Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, this is Jeremy Smith. Happy New Year, everyone. I hope that your New Year is off to a good start so far. Recently, Sony came out with a A7R5, just as predicted. And as you guys know, I have been a photographer who's been using the Sony A1 um, as well as the A7R4 for quite some time now. Now, probably about six or seven months ago, I actually got rid of my A7R4 in favor of a second A1. And the A7R5's presence changes nothing as far as I'm concerned. Um, I still consider the A1 to be a far more versatile camera, but I'm very happy to see the A7R5 because we see a lot of new technologies. Um, we see the new processor finally brought to the R model. So we do get Sony's new Bionz XR processor. This means new menu system. This means full touchscreen menus, just like we've seen in other Sony cameras, uh, ranging from the A7S III to the uh, a7 IV, and also to video-centric cameras like the FX30 and FX3. So we see that nice bit of continuity across Sony's lineup now. Um, the other thing, though, that is very, very updated, but also very unique on this camera, is Sony's new AI processing chip. So we have some new subject detection modes uh, that I'll speak about in just a moment on this camera, and we see some new physical changes as well. So why am I not super excited about this A7R5? Well, the short answer is I don't find there to be a huge difference between 61 megapixels versus the 50 megapixels of the A1. And while the A7R5 is really starting to improve on things quite a lot um, in terms of things like video, we do now have things like the s Cinetone video mode, uh, or, or rather uh, color mode. Uh, we also have 10-bit video on this camera, and we now have 4K 60 as well as 8K up to 30. I still don't consider this camera to be really, really, um, it's not the best option if you're doing a lot of video. It's uh, still, it's still, there's still some limitations in video due to this camera's 61 megapixel still sensor. So we'll talk about that more in a future video, but not the best video tool. If you guys are going to be doing like a 50-50 split between video and stills, I'd still recommend going with something like the A7 IV. And if you're going to shoot a lot of video, you'd be much better off with a video-centric model like the A7S III, the FX3, or even the FX30. And of course, if your budget allows, the A1 is still going to be the more versatile camera. Uh, you're able to do things like 4K 120, um, and you're able to take advantage of that very fast burst shooting for action as well. Anyways, though, this is not an A1 video, is it? So let's go ahead and take a closer look at the A7R5, and I'll give you some of my initial thoughts. Taking a closer look at the Sony A7R5, you guys will notice that it looks basically like all of Sony's other new models. It's essentially the same body as the A1, but it has all the latest control updates that we first saw on the A7 IV. So taking a closer look at, it, at this, go ahead and get this guy in hand, um, you guys will notice that right over on this side of the camera, we, will, we notice that we have some big updates here. The first thing you'll notice is that you do have your record button up here at the top. And yes, uh, if you don't really like this, it is possible to change this to where this is still the same C1 that we saw in previous Sony cameras. But Sony kind of did a little bit of a shuffle here. So by default, this is the record button and they've moved C1 back here. So that's kind of a nice update. Another thing that we see is that we have a actual mode uh, for our mode control for our video and stills and S and Q. So basically, right below our main dial, we can change between slow and quick and video and stills. The reason why this is nice is because on the older Sony bodies, if you wanted to do something like uh, video and say you want to go into video in manual mode, you had to first take the camera and set it over to the video setting, and then you had to go into the menu and select which exposure mode you wanted. Well, now you don't have to do that. You know, Now you can go in here and you can choose between uh, P, A, S, and M, or auto, and then just simply put it into whichever mode you want, whether it be still or video. So it's much more efficient there. Another thing that's nice on this camera is that you can reprogram this exposure compensation dial. Again, this is something that we first saw on the A7 IV, 
And the reason why this is so nice is because a lot of us don't use the exposure compensation dial. And uh, I know I never do. And so if you're primarily you know, shooting in manual and not having the camera do any type of exposure uh, changes for you, then you don't need the exposure comp. And so being able to change this to something else is nice. I like setting this to something like uh, Kelvin white balance, for example. It's very, very useful there. So that's a nice addition as well. The other thing, by the way, that's nice about having this type of layout with our separate uh, modes here is that if you're using the memory recall banks, you actually effectively have nine of them now instead of just three because you actually have one, two, and three for stills, one, two, and three for video, and one, two, and three for slow and quick. So that's another nice addition there. If we take a look at the cards on this camera, it's going to be set up just like the A1. Same exact cover here. Um, of course, the A7 IV looks like this as well. The A7 IV though, where it differs is, it just is giving us uh, one slot that can read the CF Express A cards and the uh, other slot only reads SD, SD cards. But on this camera, it's just like the Alpha 1 in the sense that you can take a CF Express A or an SD in either slot. So pretty familiar setup for Alpha 1 users. And if we get over to this side, it's pretty much the same thing, which <laughs> is to say there's not a bad thing to say here. Um, we'll go ahead and do this one right here. Okay, Canon, you see this? This is a full-size HDMI port. Um, in my last video on the R7, I was complaining to Canon about that. I think it's curious how Canon has some of the largest cameras in the market, yet they still use teeny tiny HDMI ports. Sony has some of the smallest cameras and they still manage to fit a full size HDMI in there. So it's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> then we have a PCC, uh, a PC sync port here, which uh, I think it's funny that we still have that on cameras these days, but it's there. And everything else is pretty much the standard fare. You have your headphone and your microphone jack. Uh, Sony, they have continued their ability to make proper doors now for their cameras. So we saw these uh, doors first on like the A7S 3 if I recall. So that continues on this camera as well. One little thing that I did notice uh, as an Alpha 1 user is that on this camera you have the USB-C port here. And then you have your uh, micro, uh, your micro uh, USB port. And that micro USB port is something that Sony typically uses for their cable remote. thought it was interesting on this camera that it's kind of paired up with the USB-C. Whereas on cameras like the Alpha 1, you actually have that micro port down here under a little cover all by its lonesome. And that's actually nice because you can actually just plug in your cable release and not have anything else uncovered. So really wish they would have done that on this camera too. But uh, yeah, everything is basically still there. All right though, but here's the big thing. The big thing that you guys want to know about, um, and that is this screen. So the screen is larger uh, versus the previous models, but of course that's not the big thing everybody's all interested in. We now have a screen tilting mechanism that pleases everybody. First of all, I'd like to say I am a still photographer primarily, and I absolutely hate flip out screens. I hate flip out screens. And the reason why I hate flip out screens is because if I'm shooting tethered and yes, I do still tether with the cable sometimes. And yes, I do still use a wireless connection, but sometimes tethering with the cable is better. I will make a video on that very soon and give you guys a tutorial about how I tether with Sony cameras. But yeah, sometimes I tether with the cable. And if you're tethering with the cable and you have one of those flip out screens, I can tell you it's absolutely terrible because you're going to bump into your tether cord. Of course, this hinge mechanism is designed not to get in the way of your video port. So if you've got a mic plugged in and you're using this flip out screen for video things, it's gonna be fine. It's great, you know, it's because this is primarily what these are designed for is video. But if you're shooting stills, not so much. So on this camera, they managed to make us all happy. They made guys like me happy and they made all the video shooters happy as well because this camera 
does allow you to still go all tilt mechanism like so you can still do your same tilt that you do on like an alpha one or on some of the older models like the uh, a7r4 so you can still do your whole tilty thing here and you can tilt down that way as well no problem very easy but the tilting mechanism houses or rather the flip out mechanism is sitting on top of this tilting mechanism so that's how you're able to do both I was a little concerned that this would feel kind of flimsy, but honestly, um, by flipping this, or tilting this rather, it feels just like any other tilt screen. I like how Sony, they've put some really large, like little raised portions here, so it's very easy to get your fingers in there and move this about, which is nice. And it feels just like any other uh, tilting screen, and it feels also just like any flip out screen. The only time it feels a bit weird, honestly, is if you do both at the same time. It gets kind of kind of strange there, but uh, it feels perhaps a little bit looser there, but it doesn't feel like it's going to break. And really, in uh, the real world, you won't be combining both these. I know they, they, that they were doing this sort of crazy stuff in the press releases. In the real world, you're going to be using one or the other. So I think it's awesome. A few things on the camera. As far as new features, we see some things that are very much like some of Sony's new cameras, uh, or other new cameras rather, like say for example the FX30. We do have this screen here that allows us to go in and access all the camera's main functions pretty quickly. It does dynamically change whenever you go over into video mode, so everything there is set up there. Another thing that we see is we see some things that we have not seen on any other Sony camera. The biggest thing that I can think of as a still shooter is actually the ability to do some focus stacking. Now, just like on, say, for example, a Nikon, like a Nikon Z7 II or a Nikon Z9, the camera does not stack the images inside the camera, but you can set it up to do, these, uh, to do this focus stacking, so it will adjust the focus distance and continue to fire off frames. So this is gonna be really good if you want to do something like, uh, say for example, macro photography. Oh, <laughs> took me a second to find it. You go down to drive mode here, you go over, you go over to where it says bracket settings, and then go over here and you can see there is an option that says focus bracket settings. So I haven't played with this too much. I don't do a whole lot of really close like macro work, but this is definitely something I have to play with. So this is something that was definitely missing from Sony's cameras. You can set this up to where it will actually go ahead and you can even have these images saved to their own specific folder in the camera. So this way you can have, you can know exactly which shots were uh, to be used for combining into a bracketed shot later. So that way once you get back to your computer, you can take those images and put them into the uh, software of your choice and be able to stack everything that way. So really nice feature there. Um, we also see a few other features from cameras like the a7 IV. So if I go in, for example, and switch this camera over to video mode, just like this, you guys will notice that we'll have access to a few more things. So if I go in here, probably one of the biggest things that I've noticed is that we also get that focus map. So if we come down here and go to where it says focus assist, you can see we can turn on our focus map. And that focus map, if you guys are not familiar, Basically, it's a little bit more advanced type of focus uh, peaking type of setup. So it tells you graphically what is in focus the most and what is in focus the least. And so you can see whenever I get to an area that's completely in focus, you can see how it doesn't have any color to it at all. And it kind of gives us a graphical display of which areas of our frame is in, are in focus and which ones aren't. And kind of gives us a graphical representation of our depth of field. A few other minor little, thing, minor little things that I like, I like how they've changed the battery uh, meter as well. So now it looks more like the battery meter on the cinema cameras like the FX3 uh, and the latest firmware as well as the FX30. So that's a nice addition too. So there's a lot of little small improvements about this camera that add up to a lot. Um, we also have the uh, ability to have our focus breathing uh, compensation. So if you have a lens on the camera like this 50 millimeter 1.2, excellent lens, but it does have some focus breathing. You know, the composition does change whenever you rack the focus. 
So you can go in and turn on that focus breathing compensation. It will electronically compensate uh, by cropping in a little bit. So as you rack the uh, lens through its focus range, you won't see the composition change any. So that's pretty cool as well. So there's a lot of small things. Probably the biggest thing, honestly, over this screen that folks have been asking me about on this camera is the autofocus. And this is something that I am going to have to go out into the field and I'm gonna to have to test more. So um, let's see, it's almost January. I'm not sure why, but every January I seem to be out by the river in the cold testing um, the autofocus system on a camera on these seagulls and things like that. And it looks like that's going to be what I'm going to be doing this year. So definitely subscribe to the channel to see that in a future video. But uh, yeah, if we go in here, subject recognition mode, we have all these newer modes. So we can go in here and set this to not only human or bird, but we can do uh, we can do a lot of other things too. We can do insects and car train and airplane and so forth. The other thing that's interesting about this is I heard a lot of photographers complain that if they were photographing wildlife, they didn't like having the bird uh, eye autofocus be a totally separate category. To like, well, one second I may be photographing a bear, the next second I may see an eagle. And so now I notice that we have the ability to go in here and have it on animal and bird. You know, guys, because birds are, are not animals. Um, <laughs> but yes, it's, it's nice to be able to have a setting that combines them. If you go over to the right, you can go in here and you can actually kind of prioritize. You can prioritize <clears throat> exactly the area of the subject you want to focus on, whether it be the just the eye or the eye of the head and so on. So my only the only thing I'm, I would say about this is that it's getting very, very complicated. I mean, this is, I'm a, I mean, I'm a very techy guy, but this is actually a lot of stuff that one would have to go in here and change. But of course, I'm going to play with it and report back and see how it all does. So we've got a lot of options here. This camera has a specific chip inside uh, that's actually designed to be able to do nothing but help accelerate its AI learning. So that's an interesting thing. We don't see that any, you know, on any of the other Sony cameras at this point. So it'll be very interesting to see how this camera compares to the A1. I already have my theories about that. I still think that the A1 is going to have a big advantage once the object is moving very quickly. And, but I think this camera is going to do better at being able to discern and figure out what subject it needs to focus on and just locate the target. But I think the A1 will be able to track it better, but stay tuned. We're going to actually go out into the field and find out that for sure. So very, very interesting. We've got a lot of very interesting things to look at. Um, I did take a quick look at this camera's images versus the A1 images at different ISO levels. Um, I might show you guys a couple of them throughout the course of the video, just kind of flash them on the screen. Honestly, I don't see a big, big difference uh, at high ISO. Anyways, I'll probably, got, I'll probably go ahead and put a little link in the description so you guys can download some images and kind of make that judgment for yourself. But both cameras, of course, are really, really good at high ISO shooting. They're both very good quality. Um, what else? I think that's about it for now. This video is already going to be probably longer than it needs to be. This is kind of like the initial first look after all and not really a full in-depth look at things. I definitely want to get this camera out into the field and that will happen very soon. So tell you what guys, in the meantime, write me in the comments below. Let me know what you want me to actually test once I get in the field and I will work my hardest to make that happen so we can kind of get more questions answered and so that we can all learn more together. Definitely be sure to subscribe to the channel for all the updates and don't forget to also follow me on social media. I am on Instagram and Facebook as Photog J the Great because, uh, well, I am great and I'm a photographer so that's a very obvious name for me. Anyways guys, until next time, this is Jeremy Smith, signing off.